Feeling myself With the food I eat Toxic to my health Till I Got the news There's another path That I could Welcome to the new Health Conversation television show coming to you live from our Denver, Colorado studios. I'm your host and moderator, Coach Steve Toth, and I'm here with Peter Greenlaw, as usual. He's known as the, most, um, the world's most prominent investigative scientist. Welcome health, health show. investigative scientist. What did I say? <laughs> Scientists. Oh, health. Health, health investigative. Okay, health. That's what they say about me anyway. I'm not always right. No. <laughs> okay. So our team today is how processed foods took over the American Meal. And our guest today is Melanie Warner. She's an author, also a freelance journalist, and she writes about the, uh, the food industry. She has worked uh, as a reporter for the New York Times. She was a senior writer uh, for the Fortune magazine, and she's also a blogger for CBSNews.com and USNews.com. Those are great backgrounds. Thank you. And thank That's, you for being I'm here. I'm thrilled to be here. So how long have you, Melanie, been in this conversation of um, processed foods and fast foods and these type of things? Well, I mean, I, how many years? I, I think, oh, in terms of years, how, I've been writing about the food industry since 2004. 2004. You okay, do the so math it's been on a while. that one. Okay. Yeah. Nine right, years. So, so yeah, here's nine what years. I'm really curious about. But I was about. interested in it long before that. And I think, okay. you know, my, my mom was really a formative influence. So it goes, really goes back to childhood, although, oh, okay. you know, on a different level. All right, but in terms of, because in a way I see both of you very similar. It's almost like you're somewhat a carbon copy of Peter, except that you have a specific, more specific focus. He's more, I think, more general in, in, in health. He gets into a lot of different things, not just processed foods and, and, and also the uh, McDonald's and all those other, mm -hmm. other stores. But uh, what I'm really curious about, of all those years since you've been studying this, because you must have read a lot of books and... You must have talked to a lot of people in the industry. What is the one thing that like grabbed you the most? Like when you said, when your heart dropped, and you said, "Oh my God, I had no idea this was going on." What would that be? Yeah. There, well, there was there was one conversation I remember having when I when not too long after I first started covering the food industry, um, and I talked to a um, a food scientist, a, a food chemist, which I didn't even, even really know at the time what that was, that there were people called food chemists and food scientists. And I remember him telling me about how vegetable oil is made. And vegetable oil is something maybe, it's an ingredient, you don't think a lot about it, it but it's in most processed food. I mean, everyone probably everyone has had vegetable oil today, mm -hmm. you know, when it's used to fry food. And he was telling me the, about the process of making it, and he said, these factories, you know, they're these huge factories, they have to be explosion-proof. And I thought, this is something that makes our food, why does it need to be explosion <laughs> Like, that doesn't make any sense to me, you know, just as a consumer, as an eater, as a, someone looking at it from the outside in. Well, and, and, and again, vegetable oil sounds good, right? Vegetable oil sounds good, right? Great, it sounds great, healthy. Oh, it's, my gosh, let's have some... It comes from vegetables. Right, exactly. Right. So, and this, you know, these are one, this is one of the mainstay backbone products of the processed food industry, this vegetable oil. Um, a lot of it comes from soybeans. Anyway, the reason it has to be explosion proof is because they're um, extracting the oil using this um, um, fairly toxic, neurotoxic chemical called hexane. And so that just started me thinking about, well, what else is there about the food industry that I don't know, that I don't understand about how um, these common ingredients and these common products that we're all eating, how they're made. And it just started me on this search, um, this fascination, really, kind of a search down the rabbit hole about um, food production and how it's evolved over the last century. Okay. So, so let me ask the question a different way. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that, that means I didn't answer so, so, No, no. I don't know what that means. Yeah. But what I'm curious about, and, I, and I'm sure our, our viewers is, is also curious about, is you spent, let's say, from 2006 through today, let's yeah. say nine years. 2004. 2004? Right. Nine okay. years. Nine years. Okay, so nine years. On and off. On and off. Took okay. some breaks. But you must have seen some things, and you must have heard some things that the general public doesn't see and doesn't experience. Mm -hmm. Give us the one that you just went, oh, my God, mm -hmm. I can't believe this is possible. 
I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Uh, uh, you're, Am I asking? Is too there much? one you know <clears throat> moment where the where the heavens opened up? And, mm -hmm. No, I don't yeah, no. think. Um, I think it's a cumulative, right? It's it's this okay. cumulative um, a discovery that I had um, talking to people that are in the food industry. Um, I mean, I was amazed to go to tr these trade shows where people are selling these uh, food ingredients, and there are thousands of them, and they're these in these huge convention halls. Um, and just the sheer volume of the number of people that are devoted to this industry, that are devoted to making processed food, and the way they talk about food was absolutely stunning to me. They use all kinds of terminology, and they have a whole different worldview about food. Um, they look at it almost like a puzzle, how to take food apart and put it together. Um, they talk about food as an application. Like they'll say things like, this is an ingredient for a cheese application or a meat application. And I mean, I you know what the heck is that? So, they are, cheese so what you're saying is they are not. I know what cheese is, so they are not cooking. What you're saying? What right. are they doing? They're not cooking at all. What are they doing? Um, they're disassembling food. They're looking at food down to a very molecular level at a, at a very chemical level, and they're figuring out how to take food apart in the most economical way. And they're usually using main mainly four food crops: the the big ones that you hear about, soy, corn, um, wheat, and dairy, to some extent. And they are using those as base ingredients, and then they're reassembling food back together again, um, almost as if it were a piece of software, right. it, which is maybe why they call it an application. Well, you know, one of my favorite expressions that I use all the time, I said, food will never be enough again. This isn't food. We're talking about blowing up factories. We're talking about neurotoxins that they're using to process this stuff. See, it's not just the processing, and you know more about it than I do because you did the research, but in my general understanding, it's way more than just processing it. They're literally taking and manipulating basically the DNA of plants and things to create this stuff that looks like, they call it cheese, but it's not, okay? It's, so it's scientifically being created. Yeah, it's engineered food, engineered food. right? Would right. you say that's close? It's right? absolutely engineered food. And we said and this on the show many times that... Yeah. The food that we're talking about, <laughs> it's not real. Is right. that, would that be accurate? It's edible, but well, it's yeah, a but question it's of whether food. it's, yeah, it depends what your question of food is. If food is something that is designed to, to nourish you and make you feel satiated and full um, and make you feel good or your, your, to keep your body healthy, then no, it's not food. Well, another way that It's I edible just... and it, it fills you up temporarily. Right, and would you agree good. with this? Basically what it is, it's not what came out of the ground. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's not what ended up in the package, okay? Yeah. What came out of the ground so, has no so, resemblance other than they call it cheese or they'll call it um, butter or they'll call it whatever. Look, look at all the chemicals <clears throat> we have. Oh, my gosh, it can't be butter. Well, that's because it isn't, right? Right? <laughs> right? It's chemically it has altered. To do with butter. It has nothing to do with butter except right. they call it butter. They call it cheese. <clears throat> they call it, um, you know, grains. Really? Well, it started out that way, but it's been so manipulated chemically, yeah. right? Right. They've got genius biochemists that are working on this stuff. Well, it's just, it's the distance, you know, a lot of this, what we're talking about with processed food, it's, it's the journey that food goes on. I mean, everything starts out at a farm, right? Even high fructose corn syrup starts out as a, an ear of corn, which is a, you know, a fairly healthy, um, they use a different type of corn than we eat corn on the cob, but it's a fairly healthy um, food, has lots of nutrition, lots of vitamins, and by the time they're done processing it, they're subject to many different industrial processes. Um, it's high fructose corn syrup, and it's a completely different product. So it's the, it, it really matters the journey that our food goes on, and that's part of the, the story that I wanted to tell in the book, looking at different foods and different ingredients and what happens to them. Because um, it, that, it really matters a lot in, in how you view nutrition. Yeah. So let's look at one of those things that you mentioned uh, just a minute ago. You mentioned soy. Yeah. And I lived in Boulder for over 12 years. So I know, I know how everybody in Boulder, and Boulder is very, I could say, very conscious about what they put in their mouth. Um, and I, I mean, everybody is on bicycles. Everybody... Yeah. Um, and I'm surprised that there are McDonald's in Boulder, by the way. <laughs> well, that's what, I mean, you, yeah, you think Boulder is healthy, and it, it is one of the healthier, probably, <clears throat> places in the country. But I was at my, my kid's school today volunteering, and there was a kid that had a huge bag of Cheetos. You know, they, they, that was his snack. Like, not mm. just a little one, like a huge bag. And I saw lots of other processed food that kids mm. were eating. So it may not be as healthy as people think. Okay. So what is it about, like, tofu? Because it's so popular. I, I remember how popular it was. Yeah. And I don't actually eat it anymore, but I, when I lived there, I, I, I did. Mm -hmm. Because everybody wanted to, you know, I always ordered a veggie sandwich or tofu this, tofu that, all kinds of salads. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And um, 
Um, so so t tell us the truth about what yeah. is tofu. Yeah, well, the problem with it, when you talk about soy foods, it's really, I mean, when you say soy, it's almost a meaningless term because there's so many different iterations of it. So, and tofu, I think, falls a little bit in the middle. Tofu usually is actually made with whole soybeans. So they're soaked, um, and then um, the, the water is run off, and you're basically collecting the solids. That's a very simplified version of, of exp explanation of how they make it. So um, it's somewhere in the middle. The, the, the soy products that I write about in the book that are these sort of what Michael Pollan would call edible food-like substances are things like soy protein, soybean oil, where it's highly processed. Um, you take what's in, in, in a farm in nature, a very nutritious product, a soybean, and you process it down to where there's almost no nutrition left. Like in, in soy protein, all you have is protein. All of the uh, minerals and the vitamins are all removed. Same thing with soybean oil. Um, and those are the ones that are used in processed food. So tofu is kind of, tofu is okay. Um, some, some people have, um, you know, varying opinions on tofu, but I, I think it's, it's a perfectly fine healthy food. The he even healthier soy products are the ones that are fermented. So things like tempeh, um, it's less well known as tofu, but tempeh is actually very nutritious. Fermented foods are a fantastic source of, of nutrition, not only because they have beneficial bacteria, but they, they break down food in a very um, helpful, natural way that enhances the nutrition. Well, one of the interesting things, we had <clears throat> Dr. Michael Colgan on one of our shows a few weeks ago, who's one of the world's leading experts on protein. And he said the human body was never meant to eat pro uh, soy protein. The body has a terrible time breaking it down. And he said, for example, in Asian cultures where they primarily eat soy, okay, way less muscle mass and they age much faster. So here we are again thinking, oh, we're doing this healthy thing. We're vegans. We're eating soy, et cetera. No, the human body was never meant to do it. Now, we adapt to it as opposed to, say, a whey protein. Or, and the other problem is that so many, when you do a vegetable protein, like they'll do a pea protein, for example, it doesn't have the amino acid profile that we need for the human body. Because as he told us, mm -hmm. we have 350,000 different proteins in the human body. It's the single most important nutrient that most people don't understand and most people don't do. So here we are, like in Boulder, they're eating healthy, they're doing soy, they're eating tofu, et cetera. No, it's not. It's not. If you're really talking about maximizing your human potential and maximizing your health, that's not what you want to be eating. You can eat it every once in a while, but if you think that's healthy, it's not. See, yeah. there's another one of the big misconceptions. Well, Let alone then they yeah. process it. Then they make it even worse. Well, there's a vegetarian junk food industry out there, right? Yes. You go into the freezer aisle at any supermarket and certainly at Whole Foods and you see veggie burgers and you right. see chicken, you know, in quotes. Um, but and, that's not and, really chicken or really soy. And all that soy. stuff is high, highly, highly processed, processed food right? made with soy protein, which mm -hmm. isn't, you know, it's, you can't call that wholesome. And it, it doesn't have a lot of nutrition in it. So you, See, you so do. You have to look at the ingredient. But I stand by tempeh. I do think yeah. tempeh is healthy. But you understand what she's saying. She's supporting the point <clears> that, <throat> number one, food will never be enough again. And don't think you just go into the store and it's food because it's really, yeah, it's not. most of it's, it's not, not. All right. And we know that, for example, well, back to corn. But there is plenty of, of healthy food in the supermarket. Yes, you if you know what just, to look for. Well, right, you, you shop the edge, you go around the right. perimeters, right? You go to the produce section, yeah. you look and see if there's a bulk section. Right. Um, th you go to the area where they have canned beans right. and um, plain oatmeal and cans of nuts. There's all kinds of healthy things in the supermarket but that don't cost an arm and a leg I, I, that, I are, love, that are very I, available. I love your book. I love, I love the, you know, the, 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 I mean, Pandora's lunchbox. It's like, really? Like, what the heck's in there? I mean, that's kind of like what you've said, is that we have no idea when it's processed... I mean, who knows? They could be making it with gasoline byproducts for all we know. We don't, we don't know. Because right. I, uh, in, actually, in Michael Poland's book. But you book, can tell a lot by looking at the ingredients. Yes. Right? So, normally so when you can't pronounce it, to, it's right. not good. And if it has too many ingredients and things that you don't understand and things that you wouldn't have at home in your home kitchen. Probably shouldn't be eating it. Then it's probably a highly processed food and you think, you know. It can, it, it can certainly fit into a diet, but you put it in that category. Like, like I'll give you an example. Like, okay, Chicken McNuggets, all right? <clears throat> Michael Pollan writes about in his book, Omnivore's Dilemma, that the, the ingredient in there that preserves it is butane. Like, you know, in a lighter. But the FDA said, because it's not in great quantities, that you don't have to worry about it. I just think, like, ingesting butane is probably not a great thing to be doing. Yeah. 
right, in general? Yeah, well, butane is a component of one of the food additives that, right. that's in there. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. No, there's a lot of there's a lot of things that in, 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 that are in food that we know are toxic, but the argument is that by the FDA and the food scientists, that not they enough. Have small, to... very very small doses, so it's not going to be a problem. But now, and maybe they're right, except if you're consuming it over and over again right. all the time, and you're consuming multiple um, products that have these additives in them, that's another question of whether there's there's a buildup and then whether there's an accumulation, and your body has to deal with all of these. Um, Toxins. Okay, but why why are they engineering food versus providing us the the real stuff? Why? It's more profitable. Oh, so it's about money. Yeah, I mean these are publicly <laughs> so, traded so, companies. They have to make money, <laughs> you know. Oh, okay. There's no so, charity food companies. <clears throat> she yeah. wrote for Fortune. I mean that's a that's a business endeavor, right? They're trying to make a profit. But all this stuff is making us ill, making us sick. I mean, you can make so much more breaking down corn. Breaking down soybeans, then you can act, then you can by actually selling the corn and selling the soybeans, and you build it up into other other products using cheap ingredients. But, but who's de who decided that this was okay? How, how does I don't understand how this works. Well, it built up gradually. You know, I mean, uh -huh. the food processing really started around the turn of the twentieth century. That was when we we first saw the first processed foods. We had the first breakfast cereal. Um, Oreos came in around nineteen. 10, or Malamars came in around 1910, 1912, um, and you just saw it build gradually. But it wasn't really until after um, after the Second World War um, that the processed food makers really started gearing up towards trying to make um, um, stop people from cooking and give a message to housewives that it was now okay to feed their family things that they took out of the freezer. It actually took them a while um, to convince housewives of this. Mm. It was it was probably a decade or two before it really worked, and probably. Co coinciding with women going to work and needing these foods. Um, and then it accelerated from there. I mean, the fast food industry didn't even really start until the 50s. And that was just the very, you know, beginnings of it. Mm. So no one decided to do this. It was all just... It just kind of happened? It just started. It, uh -huh. just, it just happened. It just gradual. You know? and, and the general public, I think, is at a place where they don't even ask the questions anymore. They don't even right. seem to care. Because it's slowly it's become like, acceptable. Uh -huh. It's slowly because, become acceptable. Because it's still, you know, the, the way I view a lot of things that we do here in America is it's marketed based on confusion, manipulation, fear, and force. Yeah. And by reverse marketing. So, for example, let's pick one of those great chains that uh, have a great sandwich that mm -hmm. they talk about every day. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us <laughs> I noticed that in your book. Yeah. And um, let's talk about that sandwich because everybody believes now because if enough people say it, yeah. enough people hear it, mm -hmm. it's true. Well, that's you yeah. tell a lie long enough and people yeah. believe it. That's so so what's in that sandwich, really? Let's yeah. talk about that beautiful... You're about you know, they, yeah, yeah, Subway. They, oh, do, they, they do that commercial when they... Who's and the I, guy that lost for, all the way? Forever I have yeah. believed that what makes a good sandwich, yeah. number one, What's is it has to be fresh bread. Oh. It has to be good fresh bread. It has uh -huh. to smell good. And whole wheat. It has yeah. to look good. Right? Yeah. Look and good. Then, <laughs> and then, and then yeah. so they do that, right? Mm -hmm. But then when you look at what's under the glass, and when I look at those meats, yeah. oh my God, yeah. how thin is, yeah. how thin well, is, how micro thin? Right. That's what Jared was able to lose all that weight because they, they serve like one tiny little slice of meat and one tiny little slice of cheese. I mean, and then the bread is all air. So there's, well, explain it has very about, limited calories. Explain just about bread in general, but certainly yeah. Subway and whole, and, and, I mean, this, in your well, book, so, I was like so fascinated by that. No wonder it tastes so good, right? Yeah, well, Subway is taking advantage of the fact that most people do not go and look on websites to look for ingredients. If they're in the supermarket, they'll pick up a package and they'll say, okay, I want to know what's in this. But most people don't know to do that on the websites because you actually have to click a few times and it's kind of a pain. Um, but if you actually look at Subway's ingredients, um, just about the last thing that would come to your mind is the word fresh. Or wholesome. I mean, they, they, they but have... But that's how they market it, that it's fresh. Right. And it's, and and it's, it's healthy. And they market it based on the fact that it's not frozen, right? So they're, mm -hmm. But no one freezes their turkey anyway. So it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of a... And they have microwave in their stores. They do have microwaves for, I think, their chicken, chicken mm -hmm. breasts, mm -hmm. which are really breasts. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the bread. So if you actually look at the ingredients, like I sat down one day and added up the ingredients in one of their sandwiches. I think it was the sweet onion teriyaki sandwich. There's 105 ingredients that go into that sandwich. Um, about half of them are things that you have never heard of, you don't have in your home kitchen, you can't buy at the supermarket. Um, they're things that are only familiar to food chemists. So they're putting them in the bread, 
And they're making the bread in centralized facilities. They're freezing it, and then they're shipping it to the to the stores. So they're really not making the dough in the stores. I mean, it, I don't think people, <laughs> hopefully people don't think this, that there's someone back there kneading dough, and, you know, by hand, like Grandma Luigi's used to. Luigi's back there making grandma, the dough, yeah. like grandma the pizzas, it. right? I know th yeah. And Panera Bread also does that. They actually promote the idea that there are someone's back there kneading the dough because they have these people called bakers. But they have centralized facilities as well. Although I think they don't. Of course, the minute we freeze, freeze something, dough. it's not fresh anymore. Let's right. be clear. But they don't. They Panera actually use the freeze word conscious food. Panera does. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They've marketed the food quality mm -hmm. stuff mm -hmm. quite a lot. Yeah. So the things that that Subway puts into their bread, um, really, you look at the ingredient list, and it tells you that this is a highly industrialized um, piece of uh, food. They've, they, they put all sorts of things into, um, they use high mixing machines and they put dough conditioners in. The reason bread needs dough conditioners is because if you didn't put them in, these, these mixing machines just tear up the bread and it would just, you know, it would just disintegrate into, into the machinery. Um, and then they have this, this chemical in their bread called zodicarbenamide, which is something that is basically an industrial chemical um, that has no place in food. It's one of these food additives that, I, I want to do I what one of the comedians do. Whoa, 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 whoa. Not, yeah, should just not should not be in food. There's just no reason for this chemical to be in food. It's a flammable chemical. Um, there was it's a, highly flammable, right? It's highly flammable. Yeah, there was a there was a tractor trailer that overturned a number of years ago in Chicago, outside of Chicago, on rush hour, and they had to evacuate. It, had, it was carrying um, azotic carbamide, and they had to evacuate up to a half mile downwind and. People complained of um, you know, burning respiratory, eyes and yeah. respiratory problems. And anyway, so um, and then there has actually been tests that have been done on this chemical that show that it actually breaks down into a known carcinogen um, called semicarbazide. Um, Health Canada has done tests. The FDA has done tests. Um, so it's clearly one of these things that is uh, not very wholesome and probably. Uh, somewhat toxic for us to be consuming. A long way from fresh. A long way from and fresh. And a long way from bread, any, the way bread any, used to be made, yeah. right? Yeah. That's, I mean, that's, they, that's, they call it, this is the whole right. point. They're calling this stuff food, and like I said, right. food will never be enough again. She's supporting my point that this is what I believed. As I did my research, I said, right. how come nobody's talking about this? How come nobody knows about this? Yeah. Right? And you know that's part of the component of the Tito syndrome, deficiency. Well, deficiency is not just that this stuff, it, it's not just what's not in it, it's what they put back in it that actually makes it even worse. Mm -hmm. And they're calling it fresh, and we've been told that it's fresh because they, because they must be, they wouldn't lie to us, would they? I mean, the minute you freeze something, it's not fresh anymore. Hello? So what's the message in the fact that they've been selling these things for five bucks, right? Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, I'm sure you all noticed, it's now four. Mm -hmm. How can you reduce the price from five to four when five is, already, five is already a heck of a deal? Right. Right? You mean nationally? They've, they've reduced yeah. their prices? Well, okay. I don't know about the, you know, it's a franchise, so I, yeah. I can't speak to yeah. okay. the national thing. But I, I, I see all kinds of commercials where it says now it's four. Come on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's one of the problems. That's a, that's a conversation about, how, about cheap food and what are the, what are the, co the hidden costs in, in cheap food. Because there are there are hidden costs, um, and um, it's worth it's worth looking at what what is this food and does this look like something? Read the ingredient list and does this look like something that once lived on a farm, or grew on a farm, grew on a tree, well, came, out, came no. out of the ground? The answer is no. We know that, right? The answer is no. Yeah, and the <laughs> other thing to look for with, the, with with bread too, that a lot of people get tripped up by is. Um, I think they call it uh, wheat bread it's right. at, at Subway and, and right. at the supermarket you see this multigrain. Whole wheat. And people think if it says wheat in it or if it says multigrain, that must be healthy. But a lot of times they have just as much white flour as wheat flour, unless it says 100% whole wheat. It's not actually whole wheat and you're probably not going to be getting a lot of nutrition from it. Wow. And most people won't take the time that she yeah. took or I took. You just need to look for 100% whole right. wheat. Right. And, and the point is that all these misconceptions, because they say it's fresh. You know, like Panera, or and we're not necessarily picking on them. And this is reality. She did the research. This is really what's going on. It's not like we're we're not trying to sugarcoat it. This is really what's going on. So I would almost say, you know, they used to say, um, buyer beware, consumer beware. Well, now it's like, okay, what are the implications of us ingesting things that look like food that not only are they nutritionally deficient, but now we got stuff in that turns into carcinogens. Mm. 
mean, how bad does it have it's to get? It's damaging us. It's I'm damaging assuming, us, okay, assuming. which is showing up. So now you have the Tito syndrome, so you have deficiency with a whole new meaning. It's not just that the nutrients aren't there, but in place of the nutrients, they put this stuff in that's actually harmful. So we wonder why we're overweight, we're sick, we're tired, we can't sleep at night, we're stressed to the max because the body is trying to determine, it has, what's that one chemical you just said? Azote carbidamide? So, yeah. So, ADA, they call it. ADA, yeah, well, that, I'd call it ADA. Yeah. The body goes, what the, pardon my <clears throat> French, what the hell is this stuff? And the body's trying to deal with this along with the fact that the food is already nutritionally deficient. And of course, the one thing too about corn that you didn't mention, um, one of my good friends, Jeffrey Smith, world's leading authority on GMOs. This is now GMO corn. And the GMO corn, they're feeding into the animals, they're feeding into the cows. I mean, it just becomes this huge, um, we're so far away from what came out of the ground naturally and then we wonder why the outcomes are the way that they are. Mm -hmm. And we keep pretending well, it's okay. You, like you point, you point out that there are toxins in our environment yes. that are very hard, difficult to avoid, right? Yes. Because, because yes. you know, we, yes. these chemicals are needed to produce things for modern life. So why would we, have, why would we want to have these in our food as well? It's, it's avoidable in it, our food. Because you can find, if you're willing to search it out, um, sometimes, unfortunately, it does cost a little more, and that's a separate issue for people that absolutely can't afford it. But... Um, you can search out alternatives that don't have um, things like azote carbonamide in it and other dough conditioners and all sorts of chemicals. There's 5,000 different food additives that go into, into our food. And there, you can look for, th you'll look for alternatives that don't have those yeah. to right. avoid I mean, that, that extra her, load of toxins. I mean, honestly, her book is such an eye-opener because it really is a guide to just saying, and she's, she, I, I didn't feel like you were necessarily on an attack mode as much as saying, this is what I discovered, this is what's in here. You know, you might maybe want to think a little bit differently about, like, not that I still wouldn't go to have Subway and have a Subway sandwich, okay? But knowing that, mm, not really what I thought it was, and to become closer and closer and closer that we can get to buying, like, from local farmers, which I advocate, to buy, and you know that I'm a big advocate of, of grass-fed beef or chickens or whatever it is. Don't be buying stuff that's been corn. And then they load it up with hormones and antibiotics, and now we know... I talked about this this week in one of my seminars, that there's a new bacteria called CRE. It's in 42 states, no antibiotic will stop it, and it's 50% fatal. Why? Because of the 80% of all antibiotic use in North America, it's for animals. And we eat whatever they eat. Now the problem is that that's bad enough, but now you take it and now you re-engineered the stuff that wasn't even good in the first place, and they make it worse, but it tastes good. And they call it food, but it's really not. Well, in, in, in a way, speaking for, for a moment for the viewers, I almost feel like, yeah, this show is very important. And your book is very important. Very important. It's all about It's all about being aware of what's going on. And people have to be responsible. Obviously, the industry is, we can say, I think I can comfortably say that the industry is not being responsible, right? Mm -hmm. um, Their interests lie elsewhere. Correct. Other than and health. we can say... Mm -hmm. We can say that, for example, the franchisees um, are not being responsible because if, if, I was, if I had a million dollars and I was going to think about, okay, so um, I want to I be in a business that I can, I can make a, a good income and I can feed my family and I can have a good time, um, the first thing that would come up for me would not be a, the fast food industry. So my question to you is, what is it about people that get – they get to pick these things. Like somebody comes up with the idea, I have a million dollars and I'm going to invest it in a McDonald's franchise. Yeah. What, what is that? Yeah. Well, there are people even that, that, that are already millionaires that like Peyton Manning has Papa John's <laughs> franchises. So, yeah. What, no, but pizza's uh, fresh, isn't it? Is that, isn't that fresh dough at Papa John's? Yeah. And, isn't yeah. that fresh? Um, yeah, not really. no, not so, some of their, yeah, the Papa John's is an interesting story. Yeah. Um, they don't, they actually market their, um, better ingredients. Right. They say better pizza, better ingredients, but they don't actually tell you what those ingredients are Did or they you? tell you what they are, but they, they say we have hundred percent, um, real cheese and vine ripened tomatoes and all these vague generalities that don't really actually and what mean anything. And what did you discover? Well, I discovered that um, their cheese, for instance, has multiple additives that are, do not are not in real 100% mozzarella shocked. cheese. Shocking! Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Shocking! Their sauce is pretty. I mean, it's it's, it's from it's it's um, from tomatoes. canned, right? Yes. You know, they don't make it in the back room, right? right? But um, it is it, it's additive free, so the the sauce is pretty good. 
Yeah. And <laughs> but the uh, <laughs> that's the only but the pizza itself. Yeah. Now what about the dough? Um, the dough, I never got the ingredients for. They wouldn't. I, I got an employee to give me the ingredients for the cheese. So the. Um, what about like Domino's, or um, any of those? Domino's dishes? actually publishes their ingredients, yes. and they're um, they're they're fairly horrible. The ingredients. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not talking about the pizza, although I'm not a fan of the pizza. But um, well, and, okay. Yeah. So yeah. or so imagine. It, it reads like a chemistry. Experiment. Wait a second. How about like in the in supermarket, like DiGiorno and some of those fresh dough, whatever. Yeah. Not really. Not really. No. See, turn, that's turn, what, turn over the box and see what's so, in it. So, how bad does it have to get? Here, yeah. Here's 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 the question. How bad does it have to get before before people are beginning to make a different choice? Huh? How, can it can it get worse than yes, what it, it is? Can. It can get. It can. I believe it can. How much get worse. worse can it get? How much worse do you think it can get? Uh, in terms of people's health. No, I, in terms of in terms of what these what the food industry is doing. How much worse can it get? Oh, in the U.S., I, I th I, I w I'd like to think that we've reached a, a saturation point. Um, I'm actually more, more worried at the moment about what food companies are doing overseas. It's a little bit like what the tobacco companies did um, when the tide started to turn against them. What do, what do they do? I mean, the smoking rates have gone down in most, most categories in the U.S. over the last several decades overseas. They're selling it overseas. So if you look at all the food companies and where their income is coming from and where their profits are coming from, all the growth is coming from developing markets. So it's places mm. like India and China, China. Brazil. Mm. Um, so, so that's where we're going to see these big increases in, in fast food um, mm. restaurants and also yeah. in, in processed food. I mean, Oreos, they're trying to sell Oreos in yeah, China I, I, and I India. I heard it from McDonald's senior management that they're planning to have 40,000 stores <clears throat> In China, mm -hmm. that's almost as big mm -hmm. as what they've got now worldwide. Yeah, well, I know we talked and, about right. this before, and one of um, one of Melanie's colleagues, Michael Moss, wrote this book, Sugar, Salt, and Fat, which you talked about on the show before. And I would say the most horrifying thing out of here was, and I'm sure your research validated that, that he went to the food companies and they admitted over the last decade or so they've spent almost a billion dollars creating what they call the bliss point. The bliss point is when you eat food, it stimulates your brain because food makes you feel good to the point where you're, you, you feel really excited, but not enough to fill you up. And what they did, they actually did brain scans on children and adults, and they found there was a point where the combination of salt, sugar, and fat stimulated but didn't fill you up. And you know what the model was that they used to determine this in the brain scan? They, they had a model that they based it on, cocaine addicts. Because sugar does exactly the same thing in the brain as cocaine. Now, I mean, how crazy, you saying how bad does it have to get? That's pretty bad. And children's cereal has 80% more sugar, 40% less fiber, and 60% more salt. That's not to make it nutritious. That's to make them eat more cereal. And I don't fault, you know, they're in business, they're going to make a profit. But, the, the, but our audience, you out there in the, in, the, in the world, you have a right to know when you make a choice, when you go to that supermarket, maybe the choice is going to be a little bit different. And I've said before, cereal is dead flakes in a cardboard coffin. You'd literally be better off eating the box. At least you get some fiber. <laughs> and I'm, I'm adamant about that. This yeah. is insane because look at what's going on with our kids. Hmm. <laughs> they can't concentrate in school. They can't. They're exhausted by, by noontime. And look what they give. I, we talked about this before. One of the new vegetables the federal government now has approved in the school lunch program is pizza. The same pizza she's talking about that basically mm -hmm. what's in it is really not that great. It's so far from fresh. It's not even close. Mm. Yeah. I mean, you know I get extremely But it has to fire. tomato, tomato It has sauce. tomato. That's why yeah. it's a vegetable. It's vegetable. Yeah. You know that, right? The pizza so, now is yeah. a vegetable in the schools. Yeah. Yeah. So let's, let's focus on the yeah. solutions because um, I, I want to make sure we don't run out of time. So On our show, we if, run out of time. <laughs> yeah, all the time. So if we were the general public, right, and we're watching this show, I mean, there's two experts here. You guys know more about it than I will ever know. I'm the viewer, and I'm going like, okay, so this is, okay, so now I'm, I'm aware that it's really bad. What do I do? Stop what, eating? What do you want me to no. do? Just stop eating? <laughs> <laughs> um, pay attention to what you eat. Pay attention to how it makes you feel. Read her book. I think that... Um, <clears throat> Yeah, it's, it's very important to, to pay attention to um, what food is doing to your body and understand the relationship between health and, and food. I mean, I talked to a lot of people um, in the course of doing research for this book that for, for one reason or another um, changed their diet, whether they gave up processed food or cut down on processed food. 
And the first thing that they all told me in terms of how they felt differently um, was that they suddenly had way more energy. Right. They just couldn't believe. Like they, this, I talked to this one woman in, in New Hampshire who almost said she, her friends thought she was a different person. She was someone who, she was overweight. She wasn't obese, but she was probably mm. about you know, 30 pounds overweight. And she, um, she always used to walk really slowly. She just, didn't, she just never had any energy. And when she, um, when she changed her diet, she, she started cooking. She started bringing her food in um, for lunch. She didn't even buy a lunch out. Um, she said that she would get home. She used to get home. And she'd just have no energy. She would just sit on the couch. She wasn't even hungry, but she'd eat dinner. Or she'd have a snack. And, um, and now she gets home, and she's, she's, she has endless amounts of energy. She's doing all kinds of things. She never sits down. She's, she's walking all the time. Um, so it's, just, it's, it's something that's very immediate. People sometimes think, oh, healthy eating. Um, it's about living to your 100 or you know, old age. But it can have an incredible impact in, in a week's time. If you change, if you change your diet, and it's it's very important to pay attention to how, to your body. Well, we need to get a little bit more specific. You're, uh, you're being way too general for me. Okay. So let's get more specific because when I when I met uh, Peter five six months ago now, I used to go like, I don't want to go shopping because I don't know what the heck to buy, mm -hmm. right? So I'm just thinking that maybe the public is thinking about that, like, yeah. mm -hmm. like, and I, I and I used to dread going <clears throat> to the store, and then now I love going to the store because it's really simple. I go into the store, make a right, <laughs> <laughs> which is where all the green stuff is, right. uh, buy what I want uh, in terms of what feels good, and that's fruits and solids and whatever. Yeah. That takes me like 15 minutes, and I'm heading to the cashier because the rest of the store is useless to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you have to limit your, your trips through the middle aisles, right? And you shop in the perimeter, and you shop for the fresh foods. Mm -hmm. And think about, I mean, it's not about denial. It's about think about what kind of foods you like to eat. Like, if you like to eat chicken, find a way to make chicken at home that's, that's delicious. I and mean, it's hormone-free and antibiotic-free, and it's, and it's, it's yeah. not corn-fed. But you can't, I mean, mess, I, you, can't I, buy I, the, you can't buy the chicken at uh, the grocery store because you don't know where they come from. And well, okay, will they even for, tell us? if I right, Can but, I ask okay. them, will they tell, tell me where it comes from? Will well, they, they know? They probably won't know. They won't know. No, they won't know. They'll say it comes from Foster Farms, you know, whatever mm -hmm. that is, or from Tyson. <laughs> Tyson. Um, but I, I think if, if, if we're talking about someone that's really reliant on, okay, so, so the statistic about the, the American diet is 70% of our food comes from, or of our calories come from processed food. So this is the highly processed food that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're taking someone that 70% of their diet is, is processed food, and they're eating out all the time, and they're going to chain restaurants and fast food, and they're doing microwave dinners and pizzas. Um, I think going from that to cooking chicken at home, regardless of where the chicken comes from, that's, that's the next step. step. That's, that's step. the next mm -hmm. step. So and this, this kind of stuff is available mm -hmm. um, in fresh produce, is, is a, in canned beans and things like that. It's available at Walmarts and Targets all over the country. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not as hard as people think it is. you know. And, and cooking is not. I mean, if, if people don't know anything about cooking, okay, there's a learning curve, right? You've got mm -hmm. to educate yourself a little bit mm. but it's not it's we're not talking about gourmet cooking we're talking about grilling chicken we're talking about yeah, steam, tell us about your mother because your mother is great at steaming this. a vegetable yeah. you know it's not it's not what did hard. your mother teach you when oh you were growing up? um i mean she she ate she ate very traditionally she didn't eat a lot of processed food i mean she was not the world's best cook but i did see her in the <laughs> kitchen um cooking all the time you know we, once in a while we'd have a frozen dinner but most of the time um, she was eating um, foods that were um, she got bought at the grocery store and cooked herself. Mm. Um, and she read labels. That was the big right. education for me as a kid. She wouldn't buy any product that was what she called gooped up. Right. And that and, was if it had certain chemicals And you and I it. talked a little bit before. You have children, et cetera. And yeah. the thing I tell people all the time is progress, not perfection. We're not looking at... I mean, I do not live on a hill and ring a bell and eat seagrass all day long. I mean, that's unrealistic, okay? Yeah, and you don't go from McNugget to no. um, free-range chicken. No, no, right. exactly. But right. if you can make a little bit of progress and at least become aware to cut the 70% down, even to 50% or 40%, it's a major step forward. I think one of the things we want to talk about, again, another big misconception, we see all these ads on TV about yogurt, right? Mm -hmm. Let's tell them about yogurt about as far as the health food. Actually, yeah. tell us about the Greek one. <laughs> yeah, well, there's some Greek yogurts. This was um, one of the trade shows that I went to. Um, one of the ingredient companies, a big starch company, 
Um, starches are really big in the food industry. Um, there's all kinds of starches that do a zillion things. And um, one company was selling the starch that would help you make, help these food manufacturers make fake Greek yogurt. So you basically put fake in, Greek yogurt. You put in the starch that <laughs> thickens the yogurt. That <laughs> looks like right. Greek, Greek yogurt, yogurt is made by straining it, and these straining machines are really mm. expensive. Um, a lot of food companies don't want to pay $10 million for these big machines. And so this company was saying, well, you could just add in our starch. It'll thicken it without actually doing the straining. And then you can add in some um, milk protein concentrate or one, one of these, um, com these processed milk ingredients um, to give the extra protein. Because that's the other thing about Greek yogurt is more protein. So there's actually a couple. Um, if you look on the store shelves, you can look and see these fake Greek yogurts out there. If you look at the ingredients, if you see milk protein concentrate or whey protein concentrate and a starch, then you'll know that it's not the real deal. <laughs> So all but the big the thing about yogurt is sugar you have to look out for, too. A lot too. of sugar. Yeah. That's the big thing a lot with yogurt. A lot of sugar. Yeah. And, and the other big misconception, of course, is that people think that, like she's pointed out, that fresh is not necessarily fresh. And do a little bit of your homework, and you can make an enormous difference in your life. You know, we've, we've seen it. I mean, I've seen it over the last 11 years by just simply educating people about, I, I, I say, this is what's available. This is what we know. I mean, a lot of people accuse me in my lectures of scaring them to death, and I say, no, I'm scaring them to life. I'm just saying, look, here's what we know. You can't be perfect all the time. It's like, uh, I'll tell you tonight, I'm, I'm, going, I'm going out to dinner tonight, and I will probably have an adult beverage, okay? Hello, good for me, but not all the time. Um, do I like pizza? Yes. Do I eat it as much as I used to? No. Or spaghetti? No, it's just, it becomes more moderate. It's much more difficult because, as you know, I travel a lot on the road. How the heck do I eat on the road? Well, again, I'll have... You know, a, 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 a chicken um, salad and things like that yeah. as much as I can. But I don't know where the heck it came from. I just know, like your point, mm -hmm. it's doing that is still better than getting, um, you know, something in my room, putting it in the microwave oven and cook it in and thinking that that's food. As long as we agree that food will never be enough again and that you, you want to make as healthy a choice as you can. Why? Because I hope you'd be in, in, in want to live healthier longer. That's the whole key to this whole thing. I mean, we now know we're living longer, but we're definitely living sicker. Mm. Yeah, it's better sure. living through chemistry. And sure. what's happened, <clears throat> medicine has become based on procedural intervention. You get sicker to the doctor, they know what drug to give you. We must, if we're going to even think about changing the, the cost structure, just the cost structure, we've got to go to more preventative things. So eating better, less processed food. I mean, I still like, honestly, I like McDonald's french fries. You know, instead of eating them once a week, maybe I have them once every couple months. You know, I just get a hankering for it. We're not saying it's just like the whole argument of GMOs. All we have always wanted to do was just list it on the label and say this contains GMOs. We're not making a statement, are they good, are they bad, etc. I just feel when you take food and you engineer it, when you introduce chemistry, you've taken mm -hmm. it so far away from the farm and out of the ground, okay? Mm -hmm. We started. I mean, our grandparents didn't eat processed food. What didn't exist, right? Yeah. Yeah. Two quick things I want to make sure I co we cover. Yes. One is um, how much of all these processed foods and fast, the fast food industry do you think has to do with the diabetic um, mess that we got ourselves into as mm -hmm. type two diabetics? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Diabetes. How much of it do you think? Oh, it's a huge part of it. Um, sugar and refined carbohydrates, so um, white flour, is is huge for for diabetes. I mean, mm -hmm. we, we know that there's that there's a link between. Um, overconsumption of sugar and refined carbohydrates that go right into your bloodstream and signal this um, this uh, sugar sh sugar sherds and it uh, taxes your um, your in it spikes messes, insulin. Spikes yeah. insulin. Yeah. yeah, thank you. And um, and we know that that creates a whole whole metabolic mess in your body. So mm -hmm. and that's you know processed food. A big a big part of it is there's a huge amount of sugar in it. Even products you don't think have sugar in it. Um, and you know, white flour, it's, it's, it's mm. everywhere. And, and here's the other interesting thing, back to the TDOS for a minute, stress. We know it's the number one killer according to Stanford Medical School, okay? So the processed food, because your body's not getting what it needs, has to work so much harder. When stress goes up, guess what else goes up? I mean, this is chronic stress, not just, because we need, we need stress to survive. But when it's chronic and unrelenting, then it spikes insulin. And now you, you've got stress with high insulin. Now you put the, the, the simple carbohydrates and the refined sugar, and we wonder why of three babies born in the United States today, one in three will develop diabetes in their lifetime. There won't be enough insulin to treat them. That's the road we're headed down. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, the se so the second thing, 
is, um, okay, if kids are watching right now, make sure that you send them into the other room. <laughs> so yesterday, yes. I called my, my doctor. Well, I can't talk to my doctor, but I called the, the clinic yes. to make an appointment for my six months diabetes checkup because I'm in this, in this deal. Yeah. And, um, Time two? <clears throat> Time mm-hmm. two, yeah. Yeah. And um, they said, excuse us, but we're going to have to call you back because two, pa- two patients in our clinic just died. Was that a wake-up call? Yes. <laughs> yes. I'm going like, what? <laughs> I have never heard that before. Mm-hmm. And then I later on found out that they both died of heart attacks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, people are, you know, people are, 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 calling, are calling their doctors. I mean, heart attack is the number one problem. Mm-hmm. It's a bigger problem with than, uh, and I think it's all related killer. to all of this stuff, mm-hmm. the biggest killer. Mm-hmm. And and these people are calling their doctors and making appointments because they think they have it forever. And I just want to make sure people understand this, is that if you having symptoms that are a heart attack symptom, do not mess with your doctor. No. Do not make a, don't, don't call your, just call, call 911, 911 right. and get into the emergency. Right. Those, mm-hmm. Both of those people probably could have been saved. Well, and see, this mm-hmm. is the problem where we are today. So it's not diabetes that kills you, it's the side effects. And yet medicine is... And, and basically nutritional up to this point in time has been based on a single point of reference. So you give a type 1 diabetic insulin, but it doesn't do anything for high blood pressure, coronary heart disease, um, all these other symptoms that, are, are, uh, that get exacerbated. And then, of course, you end up with kidney failure and, and lots of other things like that. So that's why I think Melanie's book and hopefully my research and my voice out there in the world is just to say, look, I mean, I'm not here to scare you, but I want to make you aware that if you, if you allow 70% of all your food to be from processed food, you probably aren't going to like the outcome. You're not going to be surprised when you're in the doctor. Please don't be shocked that in your doctor's office and he tells you, guess what? You have type 2 diabetes, you have high blood pressure, and you're probably going to have a heart attack and a stroke. Other than that, it's great stuff because they're all mitigating circumstances as a result of. You think it's yeah. a coincidence that in 1930 in this country, out of about 130 million people, less than 3,000 people died of heart attacks? This year, it's out of 300 million, it's a million people. That's a 30-fold well, uh, increase. Heart attacks and diabetes, I mean, diabetes, from what I understand, it can't be reversed through diet, but it can be managed through right. diet. So you can, mm-hmm. you can completely change the way it affects your body and the way it I affects, completely affects your life. Completely, yeah, completely change completely so, so that you don't, you. you don't get all of mm-hmm. the, um, the downside effects of diabetes. Mm-hmm. Right. So, so that's the good news. So that's I think, Melanie, this is a fantastic book. I would highly recommend it to, to everybody because what it did after I read it, I said, you know what, this book for me, what it represents really is like, and this could be true for any industry, is like take the curtains, you know, mm-hmm. you open the curtains and you let people take a peek. What's happening behind the scenes? Mm-hmm. That's really the bottom line. Mm-hmm. You know, I look at right. her book, and maybe it, it becomes less appetizing. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right? Here's the thing. It did, no, it did for it me in a lot of it's cases. Cer- here's yeah. here's a great example. Yeah. You said how bad? How bad does it have to get? <laughs> I can. Here's what I think is going to happen. I think because of Melanie and hopefully my contribution as well. That just like with cigarettes, when they finally said cigarettes can kill you, people stop smoking. Mm-hmm. Right. And you see the ads on TV. Have you seen the ad with the woman with no? I mean, that's pretty dramatic, right? Mm -hmm. The same thing's going to start happening here, I believe. That's why the food companies are already making their run to go overseas, to go to India and China, whatever. Because once people wake up and once people go in and say, I I want hormone-free, antibiotic-free chicken that is is grass-fed and not corn-fed, that's when it's going to change. When people go in and say, are there GMOs in your products? Like Whole Foods has now reversed themselves. I think it's in 2016 or 17. They're going to remove all GMOs from their food. Now now some of their products have GMOs in them. Mm -hmm. So eventually the tide's going to turn because the consumer is what's going to change it, right? right? Right. Just like that's what happened with cigarettes. Mm -hmm. Like... I mean, really, think about, you know, you're lighting up a cigarette and, like, your lungs are on fire, and that's good for you somehow, right? right. Like, right. smoking is cool. Right. Until they realize that it killed you. Yeah. So I, I made a few note, notes in the, in the book that I, I want to make sure that we cover, and this one is definitely one we haven't touched on. So here's the thing. The Food and Drug Administration maintains regulations for what could go into roughly 280 different foods. What? Mm-hmm. How, many, how many different foods there are? Oh yeah, that, I mean that's just um, that's just a procedural thing that they have um, for they they call them standards of identity, and it just says that um, 
you know, like yogurt, they have that hers has to have a certain amount of milk fat, or cheese has to have a certain amount of milk fat. There's um, in, the, in the average supermarket, there's fifty thousand um, different foods. Wow. So this is just a small, small. And how subset. do you see how do you see the Food and Drug Administration's role as a government agency to help our interest? How do you see that? I don't think they've done a. Um, I do not think they've done a great job. They're an underfunded agency. Um, I, I think there's some well-meaning people inside there. That, that some of the scientists um, they try and do um, a good job based on what they what they what they can what they have, but they um, they don't have the resources to do it. And they're they're very busy with things like food safety, um, which is very important, preventing these outbreaks. Right, you know, right. which is a sort of a whack-a-mole game. But um, <laughs> so they don't have a lot of time to devote to. Um, uh, food additives and um, l uh, honest labeling and, right. and things like that. So I wrote about a character in the book um, named Harvey Wiley who was, who was thought of as the father of the FDA. And he was a, just a pioneering figure around the turn of the 20th century, really understood what food was and what good nutrition was long before e that we even had a modern understanding of nutrition. And so many of his views and so many of um, the things he campaigned against um, hold true today. And he, he actually campaigned against Coca-Cola, which was the first soft drink, um, saccharin, artificial sweeteners he campaigned against. Um, anyway, he... And lost those battles. I think he lost those battles, clearly. Um, I think that he... You know, would probably be rolling in his grave a little bit when he looked when he walked in if he walked into yeah. a modern supermarket um, and saw what passes as food. And he also, to your point about GMOs, would he absolutely believe in, in labeling above all else. So he would um, absolutely be in favor of labeling of GMOs. Right. And this is the guy yeah. who there's a building, an FDA building named after him. They have a giant mural inside. You know, he's lionized as the father of the FDA. Yeah. So here's a good one. <laughs> um, and I have a personal story I want to share real quick before we go into this. But um, when I got married the second time, I got married in China on the China Wall. Oh, yeah. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. And so That's part right. of our tour included visiting a hospital in China. And uh, guess what, what happened at the end of the, end of the visit to the, uh, to the hospital? I hope nobody died. No. no. They <laughs> sold us a whole bunch of vitamins. Oh. And um, I spent $1,000 worth of um, money on vitamins mm -hmm. wow. that my new bride wanted. Yeah. And guess what happened to the vitamins? I, I never touched one of them. But um, <laughs> here's, the, here's what you write in your book. Uh, the question of where vitamins <coughs> come from is China. Yeah. Tell us about that. Yeah, over half of all vitamin production in the U.S. Uh, is coming from, or sorry, globally around the world is coming from China. They're made in factories in China. Um, I think but when I was doing research on the book before I started this, I thought, probably like a lot of people, that um, vitamins maybe come from the food that contains them. Like maybe vitamin C somehow came from an orange or a lemon or something <laughs> like that. You, know, you don't think about these things, right? right? I mean, they're on the packages and you, you have them in your multivitamins. But it turns out that these are, um, most, a lot of them are chemical processes. Some of the B vitamins start with coal tar chemicals. Vitamin A can start with acetone, which is an active ingredient in um, nail polish remover. Mm -hmm. um, some Great of them, stuff. Some of them, yeah. Um, vitamin C actually starts with a corn ingredient. It goes through bacterial. Anyway, and most, a lot of this, uh, majority of it, it's over 50%, happens um, in China. Isn't that um, wonderful? Because it's com a commodity us, business. They and gave us China drywall does, and milk. You know, yeah. Right. So what? I just want to make sure we drive this home, and it's clear. Yeah. So if I go to any of the grocery stores and I go to where the vitamins are, yeah. which is all separate sections now, right? Because right. you know they all know. Everybody knows that a lot of people are not looking for vitamins, multivitamins. Yeah. So what's the difference between? Is there such thing as a good vitamin mm -hmm. that you should take, and what's available on the shelves? What's yeah. the difference? Well, there are some high-priced fancy vitamins where they're trying to do a whole food base, and that's it's kind of a, it's kind of a different, complicated story, and I'm not sure whether those are any better. But even the standard vitamins, which is most of the vitamins that we're buying, um, it, just because it starts with acetone or something awful, um, doesn't mean it's it's harmful. It's still uh, vitamin B3 that's that's helpful if you're deficient in it, and it'll still still be beneficial. The di the the key is it's not the same thing as what you're going to get by eating a carrot. Right. It's just not the same thing because it doesn't have this whole synergistic effect of all these other compounds that scientists are just starting to understand that exist in food. Sometimes they're called phytonutrients, things like antioxidants and um, 
Um, and it doesn't have fiber, and it doesn't have all these other things that come when you eat the actual so food. So three quick points to support what you're saying, okay? Number one, the biggest fallacy right now is that organic somehow is better nutritionally than regular food. It's been proven in 211 different studies, big article in USA Today, research, no difference nutritionally. It's a little bit. Some of, some of those phytonutrients right, but, but it, are it's, higher. It's, it's minuscule in, in terms of the impact. It's, and yeah. they have 10 to 15% herbicides and pesticides. And to make organic, they use herbicides. They use organic herbicides and pesticides. Again, to her point, for a long time, we used the RDA, the required daily uh, allowance. Okay, But now they have a new term, the RDI, got it, that is based on the, the phytonutrients and, and the micronutrients and things like trace minerals. And they said in the average American diet, if you went to a store and tried to meet the minimums, you'd have to eat about between 3,500 and 5,500 calories a day to get the micronutrients that we really need. Wow, absolutely amazing. Which is to her point. All right, so I just want to make sure that we repeat this on every show, that the folks, the food that you are eating out there is not real food. Right. Okay, and I want to use uh, Dr. John Gray's uh, description. When he goes and eats um, out in a restaurant or whatever, that it's recreational food. What we're eating is recreational food. Mm -hmm. So um, I also want to make sure that I thank uh, you, Peter, for making this show possible, because without you, none of this would be happening. Thanks. And thank you, Melanie, for being here and sharing your book and yeah. all your studies and all the knowledge that you have. Yeah. I think it's going to be extremely valuable to our viewers. And thank you, everybody that showed up here today in the studio and everybody behind the glass. Uh, that made it possible technically. And also I want to make sure that I say that if there's anything that you heard here today that touched, moved, and inspired you, go to our website, leaving, uh, newhealthconversation.tv, and interact with us. And you can interact with us by making a comment on any of our pages, any of our shows, uh, or just um, ask a question. And just click on contact and ask a question, and we'll be happy to respond. Anything else that you want to say? Oh, I just want to thank you very, very much because I feel like you're a crusader sort of like me and you so support one of my main premises in the Tito Syndrome, my new book that will be coming out here in the next month or two. And I think that because of show, hopefully because of this show and because of people like you and to some extent me, that we can make an enormous difference, mm -hmm. starting with awareness, which is the whole concept behind your network. And secondly, because of the fact that I think people are beginning to realize that, hmm, Maybe I better think a little bit more before I pick that up, not just to give it to myself, but certainly to our kids. Thank you, Peter. I love you all. See you next time on the next edition of the New Health Conversation TV. Bye for today. With the food I eat Toxic to my health Till I Got the news There's another path That I could choose